David. I'm David A. Lehrer on behalf of Community Advocates and Jews United for Democracy and Justice and its executive committee, including Congressman Mel Levine, Supervisor Javier, Xavier Slavsky, Janice Kamina Resnick, and me, I welcome you to a special session of America at a Crossroads. We wish all who observe the Jewish New Year a happy, healthy, and peaceful New Year. Very briefly, next week on September 20th, we'll hear from three of the leading experts on generational change. Mac Heller, Celinda Lake, will engage with Morley Winograd, a demography maven and author of several books on millennials. The following week, we welcome back Sarah Longwell, one of the nation's leading never Trumpers and a very insightful political analyst. She'll be talking with Warren Aldi. They'll discuss her findings from the countless focus groups she runs across the country. I have the rare opportunity tonight to yield to my indefatigable partner, Janice Kamenarezny. She's been a joy to work with with all these years. Janice has some introductions and some events that are upcoming. Janice? Yes, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I want to also wish you all Shana Tova, Happy New Year for those that celebrate, and I uh, hope it's a hopeful and a good one with resolve, health, and strength for everybody. Um, in October, just quickly, we have Greg Bluestein with Larry Mantle um, talking about what's really happening in Atlanta. Uh, he's a veteran Georgia journalist, and he will tell all about what's going on in his in his state that affects all of us in the country. And then on October 11th, somebody who needs no introduction, but I'll tell you who it is, Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi will be with us talking about the various challenges in America together with Pat Morrison. Uh, you can register for all these programs and I know there's problems with registration, but uh, you can persevere and email us if you have problems. Uh, meanwhile, it is my distinct honor tonight to, um, to introduce Rabbi Ed Feinstein. For the past many decades, Rabbi Feinstein has served as Rabbi of Valley Beth Shalom, happens to be my synagogue in Encino, California. He teaches at the Ziegler Rabbinical School of the American Jew Jewish University and serves as faculty of the Wexner Heritage Program and of the Shalom Hartman Institute uh, in Israel and I think also in America these days. He also lectures widely across the U.S. and Canada, and for the past many years, he has been a superstar lecturer at the Chautauqua Institute. But I can say that anyone who has known Rabbi Feinstein or who's heard him speak can certainly attest to the fact that for his entire professional life, Rabbi Feinstein is a superstar wherever he speaks. His Torah and his ability to tell a story, in my opinion, are unparalleled. He was ordained at Jewish Theological Seminary where he earned his doctorate in education before coming to the Valley here in San Fernando Valley in California in the 90s. I should say back to the Valley because he's actually from the Valley originally. Rabbi Feinstein was the founding head of the Solomon Schechter Academy of Dallas, Associate Rabbi of Congregation Sharit Israel in Dallas and Executive Director of Campermont, California. He is the author of five books, including Tough Questions Jews Ask, which is taught in schools and synagogues across North America. His latest book, In Pursuit of Godliness and a Living Judaism, is an intellectual biography of his mentor, and I would say, and mine, Rabbi Harold Showweis. I now turn this program over to my friend, my mentor, and my rabbi, Ed Feinstein, who will introduce and engage in conversation with our esteemed guest, Yossi Klein Halevi. Rabbi? Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us, and thank you for making time uh, uh, on Thursday to be with us. Before I introduce my dear friend Yossi and begin this conversation, it is Erev Rosh Hashanah. It is the beginning of the new year, and so I think it would be upon all of us to express a note of gratitude. Uh, I have been watching these conversations now religiously for these years that they've been on. Every week I tune in or I listen to the recording a day or two later. And I want to thank all of those who put these up, David and uh, Janice and Mel and Zev, and all of those who have made this possible for all of us as a reminder that political sanity and moral clarity haven't left the world yet. And I think that's terribly important for us at this moment here in America, in Canada, across the world, and even in Israel. And tonight we get to speak to my favorite observer, scholar, analyst of Israel, uh, Yossi klein -Alevi. Yossi officially is a senior scholar at the Hartman Institute, where we study every summer. Uh, and he has been read, you read him in every newspaper, important newspaper in the world, uh, most especially the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Atlantic, and so many other places. The author of many wonderful books, including Letters to My Palestinian Neighbors and Friends, which is a remarkable piece of work. 
And I am truly honored as this new year begins uh, to welcome Yossi. Yossi, right now, usually he's in Israel, but right now he's in Vancouver, Canada with his new grandchild. So on behalf of us all, Yossi Mazaltov, what a wonderful, what a wonderful way to begin a new year. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. And it's wonderful to be with you and uh, to pick up the theme of gratitude. Thank you all for having me on the program. Well, Yossi, mm. you have been writing and speaking about the current crisis in Israel for the seven months that it's gone on. Uh, and you, among others, have argued that this is, in fact, the most important, most powerful, and greatest political crisis and moral crisis in the state of Israel since the founding of the country. Uh, I would commend to all of our listeners some of your wonderful works, your written work, um, recent pieces in the Times of Israel, um, and, and most especially I would commend the interviews you've given with many of my own rabbinic colleagues at the Hartman Institute and elsewhere. Just Google Yossi Klein Halevi, click on the interview and open your mind to a wonderful conversation. I don't want to go back over that. I want to, it's Rosh Hashanah. We should look forward just a little bit. So let me begin with this. Uh, your friend, my friend, Michael Oren, published a book this year called 2048, in which he said, what do we need to ask ourselves as we prepare for Israel at its 100th birthday? 25 years from now. So let me ask you this question in that spirit. Um, if the government wins, if Levin and Rotman and Ben Gvir and Smatrich and Netanyahu win this political crisis, what will Israel look like in 2048? And if the people of the street, the de democracy movement win, what will Israel look like in 2048? So Ed, I, I, I have to tell you that before I answer your question, I believe with perfect faith, as Jews have said for centuries, uh, that this government will fail. In fact, it, it already has failed. And the very fact that we've galvanized the amorphous and dormant center uh, so that the Israeli center is now as, as activated, as passionate, as angry as any other sector of Israeli society uh, <laughs> is, I think, already a tremendous victory. But, I'll, but, but for argument's sake, let's, let's, let's play out your question. If, God forbid, this government prevails, what we will see, first of all, is mass flight from Israel. Mm -hmm. We will see tens of thousands of young people despairing of the possibility of having a normal life in Israel. Now, <laughs> bear in mind that Israeli normal uh, always needs to be qualified. It's not quite the normal of other countries, but even given those constraints, uh, it's been possible to imagine a reasonably normal uh, life for an ambitious young person in Israel. Certainly, in uh, I've, I've lived in Israel now for over 40 years, and I've seen that trajectory uh, on the rise, where, where it's become more and more possible to be ambitious and successful in Israel. The message of this government to that part of Israeli society, that's the backbone of the nation's success story, that's the backbone of startup nation, uh, is um, normal Israel or, or, or the pretense of normal Israel is over. And not only is normal Israel over, but decent Israel is over. The Israel that you and I fell in love with. And uh, and we fell in love with Israel around the same time. We were we were students together at Hebrew University during the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And what a time to have been there and to to have really been uplifted by by the spirit and the solidarity of Israel. That's what is going to be destroyed if this government prevails. The ability of Israelis to come together in times of emergency is going to be over. And liberal, liberal Israel will feel that it has no place in, uh, in, in this emerging uh, 
version of the Jewish state. So really what we're talking about is the unraveling slowly or maybe not so slowly of the Israeli success story. And if Israel loses its edge, if we, if we begin to decline economically, socially, uh, our, our status internationally declines, relations with the diaspora, which as we all know are already in crisis, uh, begin to seriously unravel, then the, the infrastructure of the Israeli success story uh, begins to unravel. And I don't believe that an Israel that is governed by the worst political elements of our society is going to be viable in the long term or perhaps even the middle term. I'm not sure we can make it to 2048, certainly not the Israel that we know that we know today. Given the fact that I don't believe that that scenario is going to happen, I'm, I'm happier speaking about uh, the alternative, which is that the majority of Israelis, whom every poll shows, continues to support Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. And we should talk about what we mean by both Jewish and democratic, because it is not at all what this government means by either term. But let's say the, the broadly liberal idea of the classical Zionist idea of Israel as a democratic, a Jewish and democratic state, uh, that vision prevails. And we manage, thanks in large part to the catalyzing effect of the democratic movement to, to coalesce this majority that supports a continuation of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state as we've known it. Then we're going to come out of this crisis, I think, much, much more chastened, more sober. We're going to know what it, what it, what it looks like to go to the edge of the abyss, because that's where we are now, and to pull back, to have the wisdom to pull back. And I think we're going to be a much stronger and more humble society. And my hope is that the forces that this democratic movement have unleashed will continue even after we manage to defeat the judicial coup. And these forces, these, pos these extraordinarily positive forces are going to be channeled toward uh, dealing with, issue with, with Israel's endemic social crises, which frankly, we've allowed to continue uh, unattended for decades. Mm -hmm. This crisis has forced us to face ourselves. It's forced us to face settler violence, uh, which many of us, including myself, for years, uh, simply dismissed as, as the fringe. Mm -hmm. And it's not the fringe when when hundreds of settlers are burning dozens of Palestinian homes and their political patrons are sitting in the heart of the Israeli security establishment, the heart of the government, uh, the ultra-Orthodox state within a state, uh, the, the widening gap between uh, the middle class and the poor. All of these endemic issues are now on the table. And... And I think that we're going to come out of this crisis uh, able to begin dealing with these issues in a much more serious way. So let me probe this a bit, uh, only because as a Jew, I'm allergic to optimism. Uh, <laughs> and I have an anaphylactic response when someone said things are getting better. Um, Abba Ibn taught us that we're the only people in the world that refuse to hear yes for an answer. But Ed, um, bear in mind, bear in mind that I'm an optimist in an Israeli sense, yes, which I get means it. it's going to get a lot worse this year. <laughs> so don't worry. Oh, I feel better. <laughs> I feel so much better now. Remember, um, when this is over, as it were, the, if the government falls today, or it falls some years from now, or it's re, it's elected it, through a, the electoral process, uh, Ben Gvir is not going anywhere. Smotrich isn't going anywhere. Uh, the ultra-Orthodox are not going anywhere. 
how can Israel rebuild social trust when so much has been torn apart? I mean, the, the articles in the paper warn most especially about the, uh, the army, about the IDF, which was the one place in Israel where politics were forbidden. Yeah. And now you have some of the guys refusing to serve Miluim and yeah. other guys had and other guys showing up and supporting how do you build social trust after such a breach one of the conversations that's happening behind the scenes in the in the protest movement is do we start thinking about the morning after already now and try to reach out to those parts of the population that are uh, deeply in uh in, in the government's thrall, uh, or do we focus our energies on, on winning this battle? Uh, I'm of the camp that believes we need to focus on winning the battle uh, because it's going to take an enormous amount of work that's still ahead of us. And when I speak optimistically about, about winning and about being able to see that, that victory uh, even now beginning to take shape, uh, there's still, a tremendous amount to overcome. And frankly, emotionally, I'm not at the point now where I feel ready to engage the, um, the supporters of, of this government. Uh, it, it isn't only the extremism, it's also the corruption. It's, it's the meeting point between, between political extremism, religious fundamentalism, and simple corruption. And I, you know, I've always, all these years, Ed, as an Israeli and as a, as, as a, as a writer uh, on Israeli affairs, I was always looking at both sides, left and right on, on the future of the territories, uh, religious and secular, Arab, Israeli, Jewish, Israeli, and I always felt we need to balance both sides, because there's truth and there's there are important insights across the political and cultural spectrum. This is the first time in all these years where I don't feel there are two sides. And so the question that you're asking is, is it's very personal for me. I'm asking this question all the time. Where do I go? <laughs> it's, I, I feel in a certain sense like I'm betraying uh, 40 years of, of my Israeli persona, my, my commitment to, to, to a more nuanced, integrative, holistic Israeli identity. Because right now I'm in the place of, we have to fight this. This is a, an abomination. This is a government that is morally illegitimate. And I frankly don't have the energy. I don't have the space for empathy with people who are supporting this government. Now, that's not a viable long-term position for Israeli society. Right. So I'm speaking very much in the heat of battle, but your question is the second crucial question. The first crucial question is how do we how do we ensure that this government is beaten? The second crucial question is what do we do uh, after we've won, and you have a large minority. An important minority. You, you, you were talking about the religious Zionist community, uh, which, unlike the ultra Orthodox, are not peripheral. They are integral to the Israeli mainstream. And right now, a majority, it seems to me, a majority of the religious Zionist community has shifted to, to, to the extremes. And, you know, I ask myself if, God forbid, there were another. Baruch Goldstein massacre. Baruch Goldstein who massacred 29 Palestinians uh, in prayer in the uh, cave of the patriarchs and matriarchs in Hebron in 1994. And when Goldstein, when Goldstein did his massacre, you had virtually wall-to-wall -wall condemnation on the part of religious Zionists, on the part of Israeli Orthodox rabbis. There were a few, but they were who, who supported Goldstein or who equivocated, but they were really on the on the edge. Today, how would how would the religious Zionist community respond? Well, how did they respond to Huara? 
you had a, it was almost the reverse of Goldstein. You had a few courageous rabbis coming out strongly and opposing a few Israeli Orthodox rabbis. For the most part, what I saw or heard was silence or even voices saying, well, you have to understand people are, are, are traumatized. So how do we deal with that? And, and Ed, I'm putting the question back to you because honestly, I don't have an answer yet. I don't know. Well, America had a man named Abraham Lincoln who stood at the who stood at the abyss as the country was tearing itself apart and articulated a narrative that if we followed it could bring the 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 country back together his second inaugural even the Gettysburg address Israel needs an Abraham Lincoln to rearticulate a national narrative that's big enough and broad enough and comprehensive enough to bring not all of them because the fringe will always be the fringe but something close together so, so at, ed ed are you saying am i to understand that netanyahu is not the man for that I, job i i don't see him as the i think he's correct we're going to talk about him in a moment but so let's uh, yeah so talk about netanyahu for a moment once upon a time he earned a place as a hero in the minds of a majority of Israelis, in terms of a majority of the world Jewish community. Whether you agreed or disagreed with his politics, there was no question that he was fighting for a stronger and a safer and a better Israel. Whether you agreed or disagreed. Right I, now, who yeah, is he absolutely. now? Where is that absolutely. Netanyahu? What happened to that Netanyahu? Look, I, I voted for him in the past. And even when I stopped voting for him, I was passionately supportive and appreciative of his uh, position on Iran. Netanyahu galvanized world opinion, uh, the international community on, on Iran. He really was the first. And he saved the Israeli economy in the early 2000s. Uh, he was the first, for that matter, he was the first sitting Likud prime minister to accept the two-state solution. Whether he meant it or not is a different question. But Netanyahu always gravitated uh, toward the pragmatic, hard center-right. The hard lines, hard line on security, but uh, very much part of the Israeli mainstream. Uh, look, what happened to Netanyahu, uh, I think, is very straightforward. He, uh, he's, he, he feels and I think he genuinely believes this, that there was a left-wing conspiracy, an elitist conspiracy, to humiliate him and bring him down through, through his trials and through these, these court cases. And I think it's a ludicrous uh, accusation because the people who... Um, who initiated the investigation into Netanyahu's corruption charges were his people. It was his attorney general, Mandelblit, uh, who, is, who comes from a good Likud family. Uh, the chief of police, Al-Sheikh, was appointed by Netanyahu. Al-Sheikh is, like Mandelblit, a religious Jew and a settler. So the notion that you have this deep state left that's, that's, that's controlling uh, the process and and is 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 trying to humiliate and 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 Netanyahu and bring him down is is paranoia. Nevertheless, I think he really believes this. And Netanyahu's former uh, chief of staff Yoav Horovitz, who uh, was his chief of staff until 2019, and was with Netanyahu in the commando unit in Sayer Matkal when they were young, and was one of the closest people to him, is now demonstrating in the streets against Netanyahu and said in a recent interview that Netanyahu will not rest until he humiliates the court, brings it to its knees, and forces the court to apologize publicly. Hmm. Now that's where he's at. And the tragedy of Netanyahu is that we're seeing a, a flawed, oh, he was always a flawed uh, human being, but our by far our most talented politician. And I would even go so far as to say our most talented statesman. 
Today, Netanyahu is the sum total of his flaws. And it's unbearable to watch this tragedy unfold. So this week, the case about reasonableness went to the Supreme Court. It's the first time in Israel's history that all 15 justices heard the arguments. It was a 13-hour marathon session. I understand it was televised in Israel. We just read about it and saw some clips here. But one of the things that was I found shocking, what I think it was Levin or Bombach, the lawyer, stood before the court with an attitude of complete contempt and dissed the Declaration of Independence of Israel. You, you know, know I, ju just when you think it can't get any worse. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, I was stunned. I was stunned by that. It was Bombach, the, uh, yeah, the lawyer, the, gov the government's lawyer. Yeah. And so what the government is doing is dismantling the country's ethos. You know, the um, one of the greatest victories of the protest movement is that we reclaim the flag from the right. The Israeli flag now belongs as much to the opposition as it does to the right. In fact, when I walk on the streets in Jerusalem on a Saturday night and I bring my big flag with me to the demonstration, along yeah. with thousands of other people carrying their big flags, people passing by know, ah, he's against the government. <laughs> now that's that's an extraordinary achievement to be able to own the symbols of patriotism, uh, to own the national symbols. And 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 the reason that I think this is this is so important is because what we're saying to the government is we're not betraying this country. You are. We are upholding the Zionist ethos. You're the ones who are betraying it. And you know, you know what the slogan, Ed, of the protest movement is? Mm. It's one word, one Hebrew word, busha, which means shame or disgrace. And that's what we chant, that's what we've been chanting every Saturday night for the last 38 weeks. Busha, busha, busha. And, and and part of that disgrace is how dare you do this to the state of Israel? How dare you do this to the state of the Jewish people that we waited for 2,000 years for? And so the, the, the gravity of the debate has shifted in our favor because we are speaking for the Zionist ethos. And in Israel, that side which speaks most convincingly most compellingly in the name of Zionism is the side that ultimately prevails. So I want to probe just a little deeper to this, and I, I know it's it's an uncomfortable place to be. Um, David Grossman, the novelist, uh, who is a man of the left, has written, has spoken very articulately that Israel was already in a process of getting used to progressively more coarsening and more sort of you know, that, that the occupation of, of the West Bank attitudes towards settlements and toward settlers' attitudes toward Palestinians had begun to sort of drift in, that was drifting into the Israeli polity, and that this is simply the flowering of, of, of that kind of toxic, toxicity that had been coming into the, um, to the society for quite a while. Is, is that your vision? Is that where this comes from? Where all of this, this rage, this anger, this uh, desire for some sort of vengeance on the liberals, uh, is that where it comes from? I think that that's part of the story, without question. But it's, I think the left makes a mistake when it, when it speaks about the occupation as the primary or even exclusive uh, ground for for the for the coarsening of Israeli society. It's also the fact that we've been living under unbearable security threats since day one of the existence to the state. And part of the distortion in the Israeli and for that matter diaspora discourse is that the right speaks about the impact of, of the security threat, and the left speaks about the impact of the occupation. Uh, why should it be so hard for Jews to speak uh, two languages simultaneously 
on Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, and one language is, yes, I'm permanently ruling over another people, permanently occupying the Palestinian people is a moral disaster for Israel. And we see it playing out in all kinds of ways, including uh, the rise of the far right. But, but the rise of the far right is also very much a result of Israelis just being, being reaching the point of despair about when is this ever going to end? When is the security, when is the assault ever going to end? And, and you know, I think one of, one of the, 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 the questions, the, una the unasked questions about the rise of Ben Gvir and, and, and Smotrich uh, that I think we need to put on the table is frankly, what took so long for Israel to begin emulating what's happening in Western Europe? You know, look at Western Europe. They've had they 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 had some spectacular terror attacks. They have they have a a uh, they're dealing with 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 a migration issue, but it didn't take Western Europe very long to begin turning to the far right. Look at what's happened in Italy. You have a a, a neo fascist. You have a Benkvier as the prime minister. Look what's happening in France, and this isn't to let us off the hook. But it is to put to put what's happening in Israel in some kind of perspective, and uh, and really, I, I think it's astonishing that we've managed to hold the line as long as we did against the the political vulgarization that we're we're experiencing now. Except that you, you, what's different is seven months of three hundred thousand people coming out into the streets. Um, every week every as some one of the political scientists has said this is the longest most powerful sustained democracy movement in the world right now if you know we broke an olympic record for democracy yeah, oh, protests we we have uh leaders from the polish and hungarian democratic movements that come to our demonstrations to observe and sometimes to speak and there have been these amazing uh, interviews with 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 some of these leaders who who are they're crying when they're speaking and they're they're telling they're telling us don't stop because you're holding the line for all of us hmm. and you're proving that it's possible to push back that that it's not inevitable that when a a, a would-be dictator comes to power that dictatorship is going to follow and so I really do feel like we're holding the line for for many other countries. Uh, I would put India in uh, in that category. Turkey. Uh, look at what's happening to to democratic countries around the world. And and if we manage to to defeat this this onslaught, there will be a message of empowerment here for 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 other nations. So you're speaking tonight to a. Um... North American audience, largely North American audience. So let's speak for a moment about this community and its relationship to this. You, uh, Mati Friedman and Danny Gordas, all three very distinguished writers, uh, journalists, and observers of the Israeli scene from, from here originally, uh, have written now in a couple of times inviting North American uh, Jews and others to enter the fray to join the conversation. We've always been very reticent, I think. Um, those of us, who, those who were very critical of Israel spoke up. The rest of us have always been very reticent to be critical, especially because we're worried about our children and their attitudes toward Israel. So tell us what we need to be doing and saying right now. And specifically, now that you're a grandpa, Zayda, Mazel Tov, what are you going to say to this kid about Israel and his or her? Her. Her, her relationship uh, to Israel and its future? Well, two big questions. Uh, in terms of the relationship with the diaspora, the old model has been dysfunctional for a long time. And what this government has done, as it has in, in, in many other areas of Israeli and Jewish life, is exposed the untenability of, of what's led to this point. 
And the notion that the pro-Israel American Jewish community, North American Jewish community, can continue as if we don't have a, a, a morally corrupt government in power in Israel is, is untenable. The, I worry about the moral credibility of the pro-Israel diaspora. And so this is a moment to, to affirm or reclaim the diaspora's moral credibility on Israel. And I also believe that if the diaspora doesn't get involved more deeply in Israel, then the alternative is going to be runaway alienation. And you know that, you all know that better, better than I do. And my hope is, you know, I, 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 I was speaking about the need to speak, uh, to, to, to learn two languages on Israel. Uh, I feel that, that all of us need to start speaking two languages simultaneously, two Zionist languages. The first language is unequivocal pushback against those forces that would criminalize the Jewish state against BDS, against, against the double standard. Nothing has changed to my mind on that front. But at the same time, we need to learn a second language. And that language is to push back against those in our midst who would turn Israel into the kind of state that our enemies say we already are. And I, I, I don't know why it's so difficult for us to speak those two languages simultaneously, but it seems to be difficult because we have increasingly one part of the community that can only speak a, a, in terms of, of a critique of Israel and another part of the, com of the community that can only continue speaking in defense of Israel uh, as, if, as if the internal situation in Israel doesn't require drastic, drastic uh, change in, in attitude. So, so that's, 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 that's my appeal to the diaspora, is learn two languages on, on Zionism. As far as what I would say to my, my six-month-old uh, granddaughter in the future, I think it, uh, it, it takes us back to your first question, Ed, which scenario prevails? Uh, on the assumption that the um, that the the distortion of Zionism uh, will fail, uh, I can tell my granddaughter that uh, we really fought hard to uh, to ensure that Israel remained a decent country, a, a country that that Jews can continue to be proud of. And, uh, and I believe that that is what I'll be able to tell. So let's, let's go one more, one more note on, on the politics of this, on this side of the, the ocean. There was an extraordinary moment um, earlier this summer when President Herzog came here to Washington, spoke beautifully before Congress, and then had a meeting with the president, with President Biden. And then it was announced in the newspapers that Prime Minister Netanyahu was begging for, I mean, asking, cajoling, and then begging for a meeting. And the White House deferred him, has deferred him, still is deferring him. And instead, the columnist Thomas Friedman of the New York Times was invited to the White House. And the columns that Tom Friedman has been writing have been um, <laughs> frankly, they've been almost as adamant as yours, but from on this side of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the ocean. And the question is, to what extent is Thomas Friedman functioning as the American ambassador to Israel, trumpeting the um, uh, the opinions of the White House, but in an oblique way to Netanyahu and his government? And then oh, I, don't, I, I don't think there's anything oblique about it. Yeah. <laughs> And then the, quest the question is from over here. There are those in Congress who say this is the time 
to begin to condition aid to Israel uh, on some sort of uh, moral or political conditions to begin to press Israel in certain ways. Um, the president has been reticent to do that, although I think that through Friedman, if you take that theory, he's been speaking out about it rather uh, loudly. What do we do in terms of our own politics here? You know, if Israel didn't have Hezbollah on one border, Hamas on the other border, Iranian Revolutionary Guards sitting in Syria and, and hovering over it all, a, a nuclearizing Iran, then we might be able to consider uh, more drastic means to, to, to save Israeli democracy. But we're talking about life and death. And everyone in Israel knows that a war is coming sooner or later. Uh, the the Shiite arc, the uh, Iran and its and its proxies, uh, are um, are gearing up. And and certainly, what um, what 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 we've what we've gone through in Israel in the last uh, eight eight months or so uh, is encouraging. Iran and its allies to uh, to to move closer to to armed confrontation. I think that that's uh, at this point almost inevitable. Is it? Do do friends of Israel really want to endanger uh, play play with Israel's life to that to that extent? Uh, I think we have to draw a bright red line. Uh, around the issue of American aid for Israel. Uh, that includes political support in the UN and other forums. Uh, God forbid that, that that should not be tampered with, uh, to my mind, under any circumstances, because we're talking about, if nothing else, uh, the lives of, uh, of 9 million Israelis, almost 10 million, according to the latest census. Hmm. And uh, the world's largest Jewish community, and um, we have to be we have to be responsible, and and we need to we need to find the balance between a an unequivocally unequivocal moral position, while at the same time being keenly aware. Of the dangers that we're facing and what we need to do to protect ourselves. So, what was it, Ben Gurion, who said during the war that we'll fight the Nazis and put aside our rage at the British, and then we'll fight the British and put aside our rage at the Nazis at the same time? You're asking that's us to do said. the same that's thing. Right. You're asking yes, us to speak those right. two languages at the Absolutely. same time. Absolutely. What what I'm what I'm pleading for in the American Jewish community is nuance. And that that plea is directed toward the pro-Israel advocacy community. We need more nuance from you. We need we can't just keep hearing the same old rhetoric about shared values at a time when we have a government that is actively intent on dismantling those shared values. And at the same time, from the left side of the the community, don't don't give up your responsibility to to being part of the effort to ensure the physical well-being of Israel. That's not a contradiction. It's not easy these days to hold those two together, but it's 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 certainly not a contradiction. So Yossi, in a few hours, families in Israel are going to begin, they're going to sit down and have Rosh Hashanah dinner. And they're going to talk with their kids and their grandchildren about this past year and prayers for the coming new year. Um, for a moment, let's set aside the deeply political parts of these and talk something about Amcha, about people and families and children and communities and in the daily lives that they live. Um, you've You've always opened up for us an image, images of, of those moments, which are largely inaccessible. I mean, American Jews, you know, will fight for Israel and advocate for Israel, but we don't watch Israeli television every night. We don't read the papers. We don't listen to the music. We, on, on the street, 
in the family, at the dinner table, in the movie theater, in the shop, getting ready for Yontif. What's it like now? What are people talking about? What are they feeling? What are Israeli parents worried about right now? Look, what people are worried most about is the question you asked me earlier. What does the morning after look like? Are, are, we, are we tearing ourselves apart to the point where we may not be able to put the pieces back together? And I think Israelis are very mindful of this. And we haven't yet reached the point where the disintegration uh, has become normative, where, where Israelis are unable to speak to each other. Some Israelis are unable to speak to other Israelis, that's for sure. Uh, and and, and that's, that's intensifying. But I still think that among the majority of Israelis, maybe even the strong majority, uh, there's still a, a an ability and to to communicate and a desperation to continue communicating. That's not to say that there aren't strains at the Shabbat table. Uh, this uh, at the Rosh Hashanah table, you're going to have lots of hard conversations, lots of hard feelings, and lots of families deciding let's not talk about that you know <laughs> you're, you're you are going to have that uh, i saw this wonderful clip this morning of um a pro uh one of the uh local protest movements in the north of the galilee uh in uh near the gal near the gal the galil in uh in karkur and uh they um the activists went door to door of the people who live near the site where the weekly demonstrations happen and brought jars of honey to all the neighbors with an apology for all the noise and disruption that they've been causing uh, every Saturday night. And they were filming people's responses. You know, and they went and, and one woman said, you know, when when she saw they were from the protest movement, she said, no, 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 you know, no, no, I don't want any part of you. <laughs> and they said, no, no, we're not here to recruit you. We're here to give you honey and to apologize. An instant smile, <laughs> instant transformation. So we haven't we haven't reached the point of no return by any means. We're still we're still a society. But if this goes on much longer. I don't know what answer I can give you next Rosh Hashanah. Hmm. I will tell you that over the summer, I full disclosure that Nina and I attended several of the demonstrations in Jerusalem, in Ramad Aviv, in Tel Aviv, the most gentle demonstrations I've ever been in in my life. I'm, I'm old enough to remember the Vietnam War demonstrations and more recently the uh, uh, the women's marches. Um, this. There wasn't rage. There was love for the country, a Absolutely. deep and deep felt concern for its future. And just an awful lot of just a warm sense of solidarity on the street. And even, you know, like you, the cops were there. I'm, again, I'm in a Californian. Remember the demonstrations, you would be afraid of the police, but here the police were like, you know, somebody's kid. Um yeah, I wish losing uh, the police. So I think look, I think you're you're right, certainly about the nature of the demonstrations and the nature of the crowds. It's an Israeli crowd, you know, it's a friendly crowd, it's a it's a warm crowd. Yeah. In terms of relations with the police, it's not always yeah. uh warm. Yeah. Uh, ben Gvir is trying mightily to change the culture of the police. I'm very afraid of who he's going to install as the next chief of police, and that that appointment is coming up soon. Uh, I think that the the culture of the police is something to keep a very close eye on. Uh, there have been some outrageous incidents recently uh, where police have made gratuitous arrests of protest leaders on, on absurd charges hanging up posters on the street. Uh, police arrested a protest leader. They, they came to his house last Shabbat and 
pulled him out of his house and took him to the to the station on the charge of of hanging up a poster on the street uh, and you know treating him as if as if uh, it, it, he was a, uh, a a major criminal that they that they finally succeeded in in, in catching so so I'm I'm very worried about about the police and that seems to me to be the weak link where this government can have a lasting impact uh, on the culture of of uh, of part of Israeli society. And, and who's not at the demonstrations? Uh, will Israeli Arabs come to join the demonstrations? Will Mizrahim? Uh, most of the demonstrators seem to be, uh, you know, gringos like you and me. But we'll, it, it we'll... depends where. It depends. It, it depends uh, what part of the country. What's interesting, I go to the Jerusalem demonstrations, mm -hmm. and they're much more diverse than the Tel Aviv demonstrations. Certainly, religiously, you have a you have a strong religious uh, component to the demonstrations, and the people that we have on stage, uh, you'll have a a Bedouin activist. A, um, an Orthodox rabbi, an LGBT activist, a reform rabbi. Uh, and, and there's this tremendous flow of Israeli society on stage. Uh, Mizrahim, Jews from uh, whose families have origins in Arab countries, uh, less so, much less so. But when I say much less so, there is a strong minority presence of of Mizrahim. A majority are are middle class Ashkenazim, but a but a strong minority are middle class Mizrahim. I I would see this more as a class uh, divide rather than an ethnic divide, and I think that that's become more and more true in Israel in recent decades. Uh, the the now there is some overlap obviously between ethnicity and class, but Middle class Mizrahim tend to be uh, very similar to middle class Ashkenazim. They share the same kinds of concerns, and some of the leaders of the protest movement are Mizrahim. And uh, I don't at all buy this idea that this is a, uh, a a primarily Ashkenazi phenomenon. I think that's something that this government is trying to to sell to the public, but I, I that's not what I see. That you've argued many, many times before that uh, to know Israel, you've got to know its music. And one of the things that I love learning with you is learning Israeli music, which is largely inaccessible to Americans, both because of the, the Hebrew involved. It's a street Hebrew. Um, and it's also, uh, you know, it's just not the music that we have access to. So talk to me about the music that's being heard now, especially in and around this struggle. Well, it's interesting. Uh, again, going back to your question about what happens to Israel the, the, the morning after, uh, which, as you can see, is is haunting me. Uh, I think that it, that Israeli music is is one of the one of the the grounds uh, in which this is, this question is going to be worked out is already being worked out the music that's that's being produced in the last months uh deals heavily with what we're going through and what one of the the uh, i think most beautiful aspects of of israeli music is that it 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 is a mirror of whatever is happening live at, at that moment in israeli society so when we go to war, the musicians are are producing the soundtrack of the war. Uh, today, the musicians are producing the soundtrack of uh, of this of this moment, and um, and some of our best musicians are working in exactly that vein of how do we talk to each other. And there was one clip that I saw just recently of a uh, a right wing rapper and a left wing rapper. And each of them is channeling the rage yep. of their camp. Did you see that? It was, da it was Danny Gordas put that up on his on his oh, uh, podcast. It was, it was beautiful. Remarkable. Yeah, it was beautiful. And then, of course, they come together, and then it's a little schmaltzy, and you know, it, it, it right. gets you know, okay, but all right. Uh, and and there have been lots of 
lots of songs coming out by by Hanan Ben Ari, uh, uh, Shlomo Artsy, uh, uh, Idan Amedi, really some some of the leading people uh, dealing with 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 how do we still remain one society, one people? But I, uh, if I can give a shout out to um, actually an American Jewish musician, uh, my friend uh, Galit Dardashti uh, has just come out with an extraordinary album of Persian Jewish music for the high holidays. Hmm. It's just one of the best Jewish albums that I've heard in years. I can't stop listening to it. Mm -hmm. And she, she, she does a duet with her late grandfather who left, who was a famous singer of classical Persian songs in Iran hmm. and left behind a, a body of, of, uh, of, uh, of work. And she sings with him. She does the slichot prayers for, for uh, the high holidays. And it's something extraordinary. And it's, it's, you know, I'm I'm always promoting the uh, the spiritual Jewish music that's coming out of Israel, and I'm so I'm so excited to be to see something of of really equal caliber uh, coming out of uh, of American Jewry. The the song we heard and we hear um, in the demonstrations is an old Israeli song um, called Ein Li Eretz Acheret. We don't have another place. Yeah, and, and it's a beautiful. It's a plaintive song. It's a plaintive song um, that that talks about you know um, my country is changing, my country is troubled, and but I'm not going to give up reminding my country that this is my country, this is my home. Well, your 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 next guest next week, Nancy Pelosi, uh, has evoked that song uh, a number of times. And uh, what, what, one, of the, one of the things that I love about, about Israel is that nothing ever disappears in the culture. The music that, that we heard uh, in the 1970s in Israel is still alive. My kids know that music. Uh, there's, there's the generation gap in Israel, I think, is much narrower than in, in other Western countries, partly because we all, we, we, we share the same military experience, but culturally too, we, we, we share a common language. So here's the song, Enli Eretz Acheret, I Have No Other, no other Country, uh, which was a big hit in the 1980s. It was the anthem of the first intifada of the late 80s. And a new generation, of Israelis looking for a language to frame this moment has a built-in uh, structure of uh, of Israeli music, and and the songs just keep renewing themselves. They keep making themselves relevant again, and I think there's something very Jewish about that, because uh, in 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 Judaism we don't throw things out, or at least not lightly. You know, maybe sometimes we hold on to things a little, a little too, too long and 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 too and too intensely. But uh, there's something about the Jewish approach to our culture, uh, which is that we're not always looking for what's new. We also really value what what what's what what was created before us, and Jewish culture works best when 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 the two meet. And we're seeing that happening all the time in Israeli music, and especially at this moment, hmm. where, where all of that Israeliness, that, that, that cumulative Israeliness is, uh, is being drawn on by this new generation in the streets. Well, let me thank you, Yossi, for this wonderful afternoon and wish you and your family and everyone listening, Shana Tova, for a happy and healthy and blessed new year. And hope that in the new year, we have um, we have an opportunity to celebrate something something new and something uh, exciting and something something warm that that brings us back to the best of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Let me remind this audience, please, to join us next week uh, as uh, this broadcast offers 
Uh, demographic specialist Mac Heller, pollster Celinda Lake, millennial maven Morley Winograd discussing the demographics in the 2024 election. Let me thank all of you for listening and wish you as well a happy, healthy, and sweet new year. Shana Tova. Shana Tova, everyone. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, Yossi.